Now we're going to explore some invocation patterns. In this case, we're going to talk about not just A calling B, as we saw earlier, where the consumer calls the producer. Let's actually get a little more complicated, show you a more complicated architecture. So in many cases, we've seen people using microservices in this way, where the browser, like my little mobile application or my mobile browser in this case, can invoke several backend services back on the host computers. And in this case, just AJAX calls, right, where the browser says call A, call B, call C. A good example of that might be a little shopping cart style of application, where you kind of see we have our high-level description, our price, our star rating, details about the product, thumbnail images, and of course, recommendations and, and store availability. All those might be individual calls to individual microservices, some of which may even go to the mainframe. So when I've talked to other folks about this particular architecture, I came up with this by talking to certain retailers who are specifically doing it this way. So this is a common pattern uh, for retail organizations in particular. That's why I drew the slide as I did. Uh, but you can kind of see that like location-based availability is a really interesting one. It's specifically going back to the mainframe for a lot of these organizations and actually saying, what is the inventory in your local store? It gets the GPS location from the phone, but in this case, it actually gets the actual inventory from your store from a mainframe-based uh, application. Now, you have to start thinking in terms of what happens when it fails. In a microservices world, you always have to think in terms of failure and resiliency. What happens when things break? So we're going to start, we're going to talk more about resiliency a little bit later, but here, think in terms of what happens when it fails. In this case, if location-based availability fails because the mainframe timed out, we just didn't get the data back in time for our user, uh, we're going to actually change our user interface so it doesn't actually have 15 available like it did before, but it has just the closest store. We still know your GPS location as an example. So in all cases, you have to start thinking in terms of what your fallback scenarios are. And that's super critical when it comes to a microservices architecture. So you might also think in terms of the API gateway kind of architecture. This is a fairly common one too. So instead of the browser being the aggregator and pulling all that business logic from all those different microservices and aggregating on the client side, here we're aggregating on the server side. And this is a common architecture for a lot of organizations because if you have a specific edge service or API gateway right there, you can aggregate the business logic there and you're also reducing network traffic to the client. You're also protecting yourself from a security layer perspective as well as having all that business logic in one neat uh, little location. You can also specialize these API gateways and these edge services for certain types of users, certain types of user groups or personas, or maybe even let's say the hardware that they're using. Like for instance, I might have a specialized gateway for an uh, iOS platform versus an Android platform versus a desktop web versus a, let's say a Roku or uh, I, you know, Apple TV or something of that nature. You could definitely have a different little component on the server side with specialized business logic, specialized aggregation logic that is integrating those different microservices. And again, if something fails, you have to catch that failure at close to the point of failure if at all possible and don't let it actually uh, show up on the end user side of things. Now this last one here is the concept of chaining. And this is actually where microservices really get interesting. So when you hear folks like Netflix and other people, Amazon, they talk about microservices, they're dealing, in often, they're dealing with situations where the chain of invocations might be 5, 10, 20, 30, 50 deep. So an individual user transaction, like the user clicks the button on the screen, might go through 20 or 30 or 50 different microservices to get an aggregated response back. So you have to think in terms of what it means to call A, B, C, and D. And anybody who's actually been doing software for a while is looking at that going, wait a second, that could be a big old problem for our organization because we happen to know that some of these components fail. And if they do fail, is it a cascading fail all the way back to the user? Again, you have to think in terms of failure first. You have to know that things will fail and ensure that you actually break that failure before it actually shows up all the way to the user. So that's known as the circuit breaker, and we'll talk more about that in a second. But just be aware, these kind of patterns are super critical. You might also mix them up, right, where the API gateway, the server-side edge service, also is invoking multiple things that are chained together, and you can kind of fan in, fan out. It's just You can kind of get pretty creative with it at this point. We'll also talk about tracing a little bit later in the presentation, where we talk about how do you actually know where a specific user transaction went. Okay, so this is the demonstration specifically where we kind of show you more this really interesting demo application. We kind of showed you the basics so far, but now I want to show you uh, this specific one. So we were actually referred to this guy as Hello World MSA, 
you kind of see the bit.ly link here, uh, MSA instructions, so bit.ly MSA instructions. And it walks you through the setup of everything you're about to see for the next uh, several segments. And that is, you know, how to create a Wildfly Swarm microservice, a Vertex microservice, a Spring Boot microservice. We've created those for you out of the box, even no JS one. How to deal with a gateway scenario, and the gateway in this case uses Camel as an example. How to build a front end that sits on top of all this, and you'll see it, get a chance to see that. You're also going to get a chance to see Jaeger, how to do SSO, and again, we'll, we'll show you many of these things in our, our demonstration. Uh, but even like pipelines and blue-green deployments, canary deployments. So it's all nicely documented for you to experiment yourself. And if you follow the getting started instructions I gave you earlier, where you set up your local Minishift CDK environment, just like you see me running here, you can run this exact same demo. So let's show you running it here. Here's my front end. Okay, so this is the front end for the application. Let me go ahead and hit refresh here. Just make sure we're all clean. Okay, and, and we're going to show you a lot of this capability, like here's my Hystrix monitor over here. We're going to get to him in a second, but I just want to make sure he's okay. Here's my Jaeger user interface, right? That's our, our, our Zipkin replacement. We'll talk more about them a little bit later in the presentation. But you can kind of see we have the browser as the aggregator, that pattern we just talked about running here. We have the API gateway running over here. This is, again, the server-side component. In this case, it's running Apache Camel right here. Let's zoom in on this so you can kind of see what that image looks like. Again, the browser makes the invocation to the, in this case, OpenShift, MiniShift running on my machine. It runs this API gateway code, which is Spring Boot, but with Apache Camel in it. And Apache Camel is one responsible for integrating and aggregating all these endpoints and making, making that all come back. And you kind of see it says Aloha, Hola, Hola, and Bonjour. And then we also have the concept of the chain. And the reason we implemented all these patterns is to show you different aspects of resiliency and load balancing and things like that. So it's a great place for you to come and try and experiment with these different types of uh, items. So let's actually find our web console here for OpenShift. Okay, you kind of see here's here it all is running. So this is the project Hello World MSA, Aloha Gateway. There's a blue. We'll show you blue green a little bit later. Uh, bonjour, set up for Canary deployments. We'll show you that a little bit later. Here's our front end. So the front end itself is actually running in its own individual service, its own individual pod in this case. Uh, hola, hola. The reason we have hola and hola is one is the Spanish version, one is the Portuguese version. <laughs> we have people who speak multiple languages at the Red, on the Red Hat team. The Hystrix dashboard, Jaeger, Turbine. So you can see all this is already running here. So I already have a ton of stuff running. But let's just do this real quick. Let's actually bring up uh, a couple more bonjours. Now, in this case, watch what happens here. Uh, I could have done this with a replicas scale that you saw earlier. In this case, I just used a little user interface. It's the same thing underneath the covers. This man, you know, manipulating uh, the deployment and the replication controller requirement. But in this case, you notice it took some time to start up. And that's because it actually had to instantiate that Docker container, right? So think it was a Docker run that had to happen. At the same time, Kubernetes is doing a liveness check and a readiness check against it. Are you alive and you ready? And the readiness check is literally a business logic invocation. So we know it is, in fact, ready, right? Meaning it is ready to respond. Uh, if I come over here to my command line, uh, let's just go over here. And let's go over here. OK, let's see how this works out. Let's pull bonjour. Let's see if my polar works. OK, and notice I'm just doing curl commands against it. And you can see there's the three different host names. Again, I like displaying the host name because that shows me it has three unique instances of this running. And if I go over here to my user interface now, OK, and go to the browser as a client, and let's see if we can see it here. Yep, there we are. So that we can see it's going through load balancing in a round robin kind of way that across the three different components. So we now get load balancing for free. So you saw earlier, we got discovery and invocation. That was super easy. And load balancing is just part of the overall architecture. We got more to show you, so please stick with us.